The Man Who Would Not Die by Harold Ward A Paranormal Mystery, originally published in The Black Mask, Volume 1, Number 6, September 1922 What is death, my dear inspectors? Who knows? No one but me. What is the human body? Only a prison in which the soul is confined, a piece of clay to be discarded, at will. God kills when he wishes. Why not I? It suited my purpose to use the mortal form of Mrs. Winters, and I took it. Chapter 1 Mrs. Winters died yesterday afternoon. A woman, young, handsome, richly dressed, lay dead on the sidewalk. Over her stood a young man, hatless, his hair mussed, his face bruised and bleeding. Around them, the living and the dead, the crowd surged, held back by a little cordon of blue-coated policemen. A police automobile, its gong clanging raucously, dashed up to the curb, and a tall, broad-shouldered man in plain clothes leaped out and elbowed his way through the throng of curiosity-seekers to the sergeant in charge. "'Great heavens, Casey!' he exclaimed as his glance fell upon the face of the woman. "'Do you know who she is?' Casey touched his cap respectfully. This chap here says that she's Mrs. Augustus Winters, the young wife that old Winters, the millionaire, married a couple of years ago. Used to be an actress before she married him, I understand. I don't know the lady myself, Inspector. The big man nodded. He's right, Casey. It's Mrs. Winters, all right. He caught himself with a start. No, by George, it isn't. The bareheaded young man with the bruised face interrupted. You are wrong, sir. I know that it is Mrs. Winters. The inspector gave him a quick look. You mean that you think it is she? The fact of the matter is that Mrs. Winters died suddenly yesterday afternoon. You must be wrong, argued the other stubbornly. I have waited on Mrs. Winters hundreds of times. I know her as well as I know myself, and she was alive and well ten minutes ago. Couldn't you be mistaken? I'll admit that this woman looks enough like her to be her double. Must be her sister. I insist that you are wrong, sir. I'll take my oath that this is Mrs. Winters lying there. Inspector Des Moines scratched his chin reflectively. It's got me beat, he declared. There's only one thing to do under the circumstances, Casey. Get the body to the morgue and send for old Winters to identify it. Ask him if his wife was a twin. And, turning to the young man, you get your hat and come on with me to the station. I want to have a talk with you. Chapter 2 THE BODY OF THE MAID Seated at the big, flat-top desk in his well-appointed office, Des Moines lighted a cigar in silence, offered another to his companion, then suddenly demanded, "'Now come clean, young fellow. What's the story behind this affair? Let's have the straight of it.' The lad, he was scarcely more than a boy, gulped to hide his agitation. "'I—I—' I, he stammered. The inspector smiled kindly. Don't get scared, my boy. Don't get scared. Bless your heart, Sonny. I know that you didn't kill the woman. I only want to get at the facts in the case as speedily as possible. Just forget my gruff way of speaking. It's my natural voice. I hardly know how to start, began the other, his fears vanishing under the inspector's kindly manner. The lady, Mrs. Winters, came into Harden and Company store, where I am employed as head salesman in the jewelry department, and asked to be shown something rather nifty in a diamond brooch. That was yesterday afternoon. She looked at a number of pieces, finally selecting one valued at thirty thousand dollars. She asked me to lay it aside for her, stating that she wanted her mother, who was buying it for her for a birthday present, to look at it before she made her final decision. This morning she returned, and coming into the store, requested that I accompany her to the curb with a brooch, as her mother, who was an invalid, was outside in the limousine. Of course it was irregular, but she is an old customer. You know Hardin and Company's policy. So I did as requested. I handed her the jewel case just as we reached the machine, and she passed it into the woman, whom I supposed was her mother, who was leaning back against the cushion. The curtains were down, and the interior was in semi-darkness, so I did not get a clear view of the face of the lady. Just as she handed the other the jewel, the chauffeur, who had been keeping his engine running, leaned out and slugged me with something, a sandbag, I imagine. At the same time, Mrs. Winters made a quick leap for the interior of the machine. But, involuntarily, as I fell, I grasped her, and we went down in a heap together. The chauffeur immediately started his machine, and before I recovered my wits, which had been largely knocked out of me, 
He was around the corner. I didn't even have an opportunity to get the number of the auto. We have already attended to that, interrupted the inspector. Casey will have it down in his notebook if anyone in the vicinity chanced to notice it. Were there many people on the sidewalk at the time? They were constantly passing, the usual ten o'clock crowd. Um, um, all right, go ahead with your story. There was nothing more to tell. When I came to my senses, and I couldn't have been dazed more than a second or two, the machine was disappearing around the corner, as I just told you, and the woman was lying on the sidewalk beside me, dead. It must have been apoplexy, Inspector, for I'll swear on a stack of Bibles that I didn't seize her hard enough to kill her. He hesitated, then continued haltingly. But what puzzles me is why Mrs. Winters, a woman of untold wealth, would stoop to aid in a crime like that. He looked at the inspector for an answer to his question. The latter smoked in silence for a second. That's what we've got to find out, my boy. You said your name was... Johnson. Adolph Johnson. Oh, yes. And she got away clean with the jewelry, did she? The other woman? The one in the machine? And the chauffeur? Johnson nodded. They were interrupted by a rap at the door. In response to Des Moines' gruff come in, Casey entered, his good-natured red face glowing with excitement. What the dickens do you know about it, sir? He exploded. Winters has identified the body, positively as being that of his wife. But Mrs. Winters died yesterday afternoon. She did. But sometime during the night her body disappeared, and this morning they found the body of her maid, dead, in the casket from which the mistress had been taken. Good God! Murdered? Not a mark on her body. Chapter 3 A Prison in Which the Soul is Confined Before the inspector could recover from his astonishment, the door burst open, and a man, gray-haired, tall, angular, beyond the middle age, rushed in without the formality of rapping. His wrinkled face was drawn and haggard, his eyes bloodshot and red from weeping, his whole appearance that of a man almost bereft of his senses. Inspector! he shrieked. Who is the guilty man? Who has desecrated the poor dead body of my wife? Who stole it from the casket? Damn them! Damn them! Damn them! Damn them! Damn them! Who murdered Dolly, her maid? She was murdered, I say. I know it, I know it. He glared about him for a second. Then give him to me, I say. I'll tear the scoundrel to pieces with my naked hands. Give him to me. I demand justice. He dropped into a chair and burst into hysterical sobs. For an instant there was silence. Des Moines chewed thoughtfully on his cigar. Johnson, white-faced, unused to scenes such as this, fidgeted nervously, his fingers twitching. Assuming the quieting tone of a mother addressing her child, the inspector turned to the weeping man. Calm yourself, Mr. Winters, he began slowly. I know that it's hard. It's awful, terrible. But we'll get at the bottom of it some way. I promise you on my word as a man that I'll capture the guilty wretch and hang him. Yes, curse him. I'll hang him higher than a kite, or I'll quit the force. But the affair is growing more puzzling every minute. I can't make head nor tail out of it as it stands now. Won't you let me hear your story? Winters sat up and dried his eyes. What can I tell you? he sobbed. How shall I begin? Start with the death of your wife. There is little to tell. She was stricken. Suddenly, yesterday afternoon, while dressing to go out, Dolly Matthews, her maid, who was with her at the time, hastily summoned assistance. But she passed away before the doctor arrived. In fact, even before the servants, who responded to Miss Matthews' cries, could reach her. The physician, Dr. Bennett, the well-known specialist, gave as his opinion that the cause of death was heart failure. The body was prepared for burial in the usual way. I sat beside the casket until nearly morning. Then, in response to the urgent appeals of the friends and relatives who had rushed to my side in my hour of trouble, I surrendered my post to Miss Matthews. The poor girl loved my wife devotedly, and was terribly grief-stricken over her untimely death. And now she's gone, too. He burst into another paroxysm of sobbing. Des Moines waited until he regained control of himself, then motioned for him to continue. I could not content myself. My nerves were nearly at the breaking point although the physician had given me an opiate to quiet me. After lying on the bed and tossing around for an hour or two, I arose and again sought the sight of my dear one. I was surprised not to find Miss Matthews in the room, which was empty, although there were several people in the study just across the hall. I stepped to the casket. As there is a God in heaven, the body of my wife was gone. In its place was the body of Dolly, 
her maid, cold in death. There was no evidence of foul play in the case of the maid. No, although I am certain under the circumstances that she was murdered. She couldn't have died a natural death and crawled into the casket herself, could she? He glared at the inspector as if expecting a denial. Receiving no answer, he continued, My cries brought those who were in the other room, and we immediately summoned Dr. Bennett, who made an examination. He would not even venture an opinion as to what caused death. Meanwhile, I was almost beside myself. Can you blame me? We searched the house from cellar to garret, looking for the remains of my wife, failing to find her buddy. We were about to call up police headquarters, which we should have done in the beginning, when I received the call to go to the morgue. There I found the poor dear. I demand that immediate steps be taken to bring the perpetrator of the hellish deed to justice. I am a wealthy man. I will spend every cent I possess to hang the wretch. Damn him! Inspector Des Moines scratched his chin reflectively. It's got me beat, Mr. Winters. I'll confess that I never came across a case like this in all of my twenty years on the force. You are ready to swear that your wife died yesterday afternoon, and that you saw her body in the coffin. A reputable physician made an examination and pronounced her dead. Yet, are you sure that the body you examined in the morgue is that of Mrs. Winters? Positively. I identified it, not only by her sweet girlish face, but by a small birthmark on her left shoulder. She had no sister. She was not a twin. She was an only child. Then, Mr. Winters, how do you reconcile your story with that of Mr. Johnson here, who swears that the woman whose body you saw in the morgue and have identified as your wife was alive and well at ten o'clock this morning? Yes, he even goes farther and asserts that he talked to her and that she, aided by two others, robbed Hardin and company of a valuable diamond brooch. Winters leaped to his feet, his eyes blazing, his face aflame with rage. He's an infernal liar and a blackguard. Before he could continue, there was a rap at the door. Des Moines's secretary entered. He handed the inspector an envelope marked Important, Winter's case. The policeman tore the envelope open and glanced hastily over the contents. Then, with an oath, he read it aloud to the others. My dear inspector, I have just started. I am Lesman, the man who laughs at death. I killed Mrs. Winters. I killed her as I have killed others and as I will kill again, by the power of thought, alone. Unravel that, if you can. What is death, my dear inspectors? Who knows? No one but me. What is the human body? Only a prison in which the soul is confined, a piece of clay to be discarded at will. God kills when he wishes. Why not I? It suited my purpose to use the mortal form of Mrs. Winters, and I took it. Hereafter I will give you due and timely notice of each crime I commit and I assure you that they will be numerous. With best wishes I sign myself, Lesman, the man who will not die. Chapter 4 I Am Going to Kill a Man The winter's mystery was the most interesting news event of the day, and the afternoon papers made the most of it. At its best, the city administration was not a favorite with the press. Augustus Winters was wealthy and popular. His wife had been one of the leaders of the Faster Young Society set. As a result, the police department was grilled to a turnover for what was termed the laxity of its method. Inspector Des Moines, accustomed to the vagaries of journalism, used to being praised one day and reviled the next, gave little heed to what was said or written about him or his department. Yet he read every detail carefully in the hope that the reporters had gathered some new evidence that would tend to help in working out the solution of the puzzle for in the past he had secured much valuable help from the newspapermen. But this time he was doomed to disappointment. They could find nothing, absolutely nothing, that gave him any additional light. Nothing had been left undone. Men from the inspector's office had combed the city in search of a clue to the mysterious lessman, but without avail. Only the machine used in the Hardin and Company robbery had been found. Stolen earlier in the day from a garage in the outskirts of the city, it had been abandoned by the side of a country road when the users were through with it. Beyond that one small detail, no headway had been made. The newspapers had assigned their best man to the case. They could secure not even a trace of the unknown perpetrator of the startling crimes, for Des Moines had not thought it advisable to take the press into his confidence in so far as the threatening letter he had received was concerned. Tired and disgruntled, he was about to leave the office for the night when the phone on his desk thrilled. He picked the receiver from its hook and answered. Inspector Des Moines, query a heavy male voice. Des Moines answered in the affirmative. 
The man at the other end of the line chuckled to himself. Well, growled the inspector, did you call me to the phone at this time of the night to tell me a joke? Instantly the quiet laughter ceased, and a voice came clear and strong across the space. No, inspector, I beg your pardon. This is Lessman speaking. Lessman, the man who will not die. I imagined that I would catch you in your office. I had a notion to call around and see you, then thought better of it. Can you understand me all right? Now listen to me carefully, Des Moines. I told you that I would give you fair warning when I was ready to make my next move. I always keep my word. Are you listening? Tomorrow morning on the stroke of ten I am going to kill a man. Where? Oh, no, I have no objection to telling you where. On the street in front of 1416 Broadway. Yes, 1416 Broadway. Probably a policeman. No, not no. Not you. But be on the job, Inspector. I am doing this for a purpose. I hate the police. Damn them. But it will give you an opportunity of studying my methods. Huh? Huh? You and I will match wits frequently from now on. Oh, yes. Before I say good night, I'll make you a promise. If you'll be present tomorrow, I'll promise you that I will do my best to hunt you up and talk with you. You need not go to the trouble of notifying the papers, for I have done that myself. I've asked them all to send their best men. That's all for this time. Goodbye. The receiver at the other end was hung up with a click. Then Des Moines was galvanized into action. Frantically, he jiggled the hook up and down until Central answered sharply. Quick, he demanded. This is Inspector Des Moines at headquarters. Where did that call come from just now? Get on the job and find out. Fifty dollars in it for you if you'll find out immediately. Hold the line, please. Thirty seconds later, his vigilance was rewarded. This is the chief operator. The call you inquired about came from booth number 14 at the Biltmore. Send the reward to operator 106, please. To secure a connection with the switchboard operator at the Biltmore required only an instant. Inspector Des Moines, headquarters speaking. A man just called me up from booth number 14. There's a ten in it for you if you'll get a description of him for me inside of a minute. Do you understand? Move fast. You can send the ten right along, Inspector. The man who used booth number 14 stopped at the desk and gave me a tip as he passed out. He just went through the door a second ago. Fine, fine, his description. Quick! You know him, Inspector. It was Augustus Winters, the millionaire. Chapter 5 In Two Places at Once Inspector Des Moines was a man of action. While even his best friends did not claim for him the brilliancy of a Sherlock Holmes, a clique of the Forty Faces, an Arsene Lupin of any of the other celebrated sleuths of fiction, yet once given the slender thread of a clue, he followed it to the end. The taunting telephone call led him to believe that, in Augustus Winters, he had the mastermind who was directing the crimes in the millionaire's own household. Why Winters would make way with his wife and her maid, for the detective was firmly of the belief that both women had been murdered, he did not attempt to reason out. He only knew that a crime had been committed, and that he, as an officer of the law, was pledged to find the murderer, regardless of who he might be. Just now all straws pointed to Augustus Winters himself. He believed that Winters had overlooked a point in telephoning from a public booth in a hotel where he was so well known, that he was likely to recall his indiscretion and, in an effort to retrieve his lost ground, hasten home in order to provide himself with an alibi, the officer believed would be his next move. Consequently, to checkmate that alibi and prove it false from its very inception was the obvious thing to do. He reached for the telephone again and called the number of the millionaire's residence. Not over three or four minutes had elapsed since Winters, or Lessman, as the inspector believed him to be, had talked to him from the Biltmore. To drive from the hotel to his home would take the better part of an hour, even with a fast car. It would take nearly as long to go from headquarters, and there was always the danger of an accident. Bess Moines thought rapidly, then made his decision. The telephone was faster and better than making the trip in person and standing the possible chance of having the aged criminal, and the inspector now had no doubts on that score, reached there first. A sleepy voice answered his ring, Augustus Winter's residence, it said. Who is this? he demanded. Wilkins, the butler, sir. Has Mr. Winters returned yet? He has not been out, sir. Let me talk to him, then, Des Moines chuckled softly to himself as he made the demand. He knew that there was no possibility of the millionaire replying, 
and the testimony of Wilkins would support his charges when the time came to prove the falsity of the alibi. I'll connect you with his room, sir, answered the butler. A second later, the inspector was astonished to hear the clear, calm voice of Winters at the other end of the wire. It nearly floored him. He was almost too nonplussed to reply, for Winters obviously could not be in two places at once. If this was Winters, then the man who had called him up from the Biltmore must necessarily be an impostor. And what manner of man was he who could disguise himself so cleverly that even those who were personally acquainted with the millionaire miss took the counterfeit for the real? Desmoines speaking. When did you get back? he asked casually, making an effort to hide the agitation that he felt. When did I get back? I was not aware that I had been away, answered the other testily. What was it you wanted, Inspector? Must be something important to call up at two o'clock in the morning. Have you secured some new information? Or possibly you have the guilty wretch under arrest? Des Moines knew that he was defeated. The least he could do was back out gracefully. It was not necessary to divulge his suspicions. He informed Winters as casually as he was able of the telephone message he had received from the man who would not die, reserving, however, the information that the other had been masquerading as Winters. Then he abruptly hung up the phone. The case was growing more puzzling every minute. Instead of the telephone call clearing up the mystery, he was forced to confess to himself that it only made it darker. Chapter 6 Who Was Lesman? Who was Lesman, the man who termed himself the man who would not die? Was there such a person, or was it an alias? Des Moines, humped up in his chair, chewing his dry cigar, went over the case detail by detail. Figuratively speaking, he held it up to the light and dissected it bit by bit, piece by piece, and when he had completed the process, he was obliged and confess himself as much in the dark as ever. Who was Lesman, who was the man of iron nerve and diabolical cunning? Could it be Winters, the inspector had been inclined to suspect the aged money bags, was still disposed to do so? But what was his motive? Was he insane? Had he the ability? And the nerve? to carry out such a plot, and there too was his alibi, cast, iron puncture-proof? If Winters was not Lesman, who was, could it be Dr. Bennett, the physician admittedly had more opportunity to commit the murders than anyone else? But in his case, too, there was lacking the motive. Could young Johnson, the diamond salesman, be the man? In his case there was a motive, the theft of the brooch, but on the other hand there was nothing to show that he had ever visited the Winters' home under any pretext. And it was natural to suppose that the person who could cause the death of both the mistress and the maid must have had, sometime at least, entree to the millionaire's residence. Des Moines had had both the physician and the salesman investigated. The reports of his men lying on the desk before him showed nothing against them. Who had spirited the body of Mrs. Winters from its casket? How could she, a dead woman, be alive, and Johnson? as well as other employees of Hardin and Company, swore that she had been. They had seen her, talked with her, nearly twenty-four hours after her reported death. How had the body of the maid been placed in the casket the mistress had occupied? Who was the disguised man who had so cleverly passed himself off on the employees of the Biltmore as Augustus Winter? It was not until dawn was breaking that Des Moines gave up wrestling with the problem, and when, at last, tired and stiff from his long vigil, he arose and stretched himself, he was forced to admit that he knew no more than when he had first been called into the case. There was nothing to do but wait. End of Part 1 of The Man Who Would Not Die Part 2 will be published tomorrow. Be sure to like and subscribe so you'll never miss an exciting murder mystery or crime story.